we go into the introduction. So um, I guess crypto, you know, compared to one year ago, um, despite all of the, you know, despite the market sentiments um, and then all these crashes of the institutional players, you know, including FTX, you know, people come to see clearly that um, um, crypto has a really strong potential for mass adoption. It's not like a niche thing. It's not something only for the crypto natives. Um, the technology fundamentally has some like super strong edge over uh, what we see from Web2. Um, this is why, you know, mass adoption has been a really heated topic um, about, you know, in the next bull uh, cycle, what are the things that we are going to do to onboard more and more users uh, coming into the crypto space? So I guess as a background, you know, Neo Protocol is a layer one blockchain uh, designed for user um, you know, like simple user experience from the ground up. Uh, you see something like account model, you know, you know, fundamentally when people are, when users are interacting with the near blockchain instead of, you know, like, say, you know, like got a set of a wallet or something like this, like you, you, you got like a near account model where everybody has a relatively more similar Web2 experiences um, compared to many of the other blockchains, right? So, um, so Nier um, has a vision of onboarding the next 1 billion users onto crypto. So this is um, the mantra and the vision of Nier. So with that being said, um, let's get into um, the introduction part of, um, of this space. Um, I guess my, I myself, I'm Vincent. I'm the principal of MetaWeb VC. Uh, MetaWeb VC um, is a Nier ecosystem fund. Um, with Neo Foundation is one of our largest LPs, and Ilya himself is our LP. And our founder used to be a Neo CMO and head of Neo Asia. So um, we actively invest within the Neo ecosystem, even though we also invest out of the Neo ecosystem. But then, uh, definitely for anyone who is interested to build in Neo, um, definitely connect us. Um, if uh, you know you would like to bootstrap the VC fundraising um, processes. But yeah, that that that's a little bit about myself. Uh, let's get into the introduction of um, our guests tonight. Um, should we start by Dexter? Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and then the project uh, you're sure. working on? <clears throat> GM, GM, everyone. So thanks for having me. My name is Dexter. Um, I'm the community manager of Sender Wallet. So I think some of the audience here might have no idea what Sender Wallet is. So I'm just going to simply um, introduce about it. So um, yeah, so basically Sender Wallet, it's a non-custodial wallet on near and including a extension wallet and a mobile wallet. So the extension wallet is currently supported by Chrome, Brave, Edge, and Kiwi. Um, meanwhile, you also can download Sender Wallet on iOS or Android. So don't forget to check us out and follow us on Twitter. Just search Sender Wallet on Twitter. S E N D E R W A L L E T. Okay, that's all for my part. Great. How about Drew? Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself in the project? Hey, Vincent. Yeah, thanks. Hey, everyone. I'm Drew. I'm the business lead at Connect3. And Connect3, we're building an open social protocol that enables you to easily and seamlessly connect with people, places, and content and things in the Web3 world. So check us out at connect3.world and uh, excited to chat more today at this Twitter space. Thank you. How about Henry? Hey, everyone. Uh, testing, testing, just making sure you all can hear me. Um, yeah, so I'm Henry. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Fantastic. So I'm Henry. I'm a chief crypto officer with Sweat Economy. Uh, Sweat Economy is the Web3 vertical of Sweatcoin. So Sweatcoin is a Web2 app with 120 million users. Uh, we spent four months testing every L1 and L2 in the space. And after all of our testing, we chose Near because we believe that Near is the best uh, positioned layer one or layer two for mass adoption. And we, as because of our huge user base, are one of the very few projects that genuinely requires uh, sort of like excellent technical performance, right? Because we have so many users. And so what the sweat economy is doing is um, our mission is to make the world more physically active. Now, we do that by issuing a token. It's called SWEAT. That's the cryptocurrency. 
um, that rewards and incentivizes physical activity. And now what we're trying to do is, um, or what we have done is we've launched the Sweat Wallet. The Sweat Wallet, we believe, is is going to become the biggest on-ramp in crypto because anyone, anywhere can literally walk into crypto. Um, if you haven't downloaded it, I encourage you to do so. We've created, uh, I believe, over 15 million non-custodial wallets on Near already. So I believe it represents about 80% of all non-custodial wallets on Near. Um, so yeah, we've obviously made a pretty big, uh, um, you know, sort of impact on the Near ecosystem already, and that's that's fantastic. Um, before I joined Sweat Economy, uh, I was with Bitfinex and with Tether. And before that, I was uh, at Deliveroo. Um, so before I entered crypto, I was at Deliveroo and worked in hedge funds. Great, thank you. Yeah. So I guess like, um, so Henry, I, I have a question for you. So, so like, um, I, I mean, like Sweat Economy has a very unique position, um, not quite similar to many projects we've seen because you guys have a bunch of users already from the Web2 space. You know, these users are highly engaged uh, in using your app. Um, and then they are, um, you know, they are all ready to onboard to Web3 when you guys are launching a token. What, what, what do you see and how, how do you guys, um, you know, what sort of um, user research have you guys done to understand like all these Web2 users? How open are they? How open were they? about coming into crypto um you know what are some of the challenges you see uh when we are onboarding web2 users who have no understanding about web3 uh, but then coming into the web3 space thank you vincent by the way uh you were sort of breaking up a little bit at the end um but i i heard everything um so basically oh, sorry. no problem um so it, it's that's a great question uh so we did a lot of user research, right, uh, before we made the the jump into, uh, or we made the decision that now is the time to go into crypto. It's worth noting that Sweatcoin, as the name suggests, Sweatcoin is our Web2 app, right? As the name suggests, it was always intended to be a cryptocurrency. The thing is, is that, you know, we launched the beta in uh, in 2016, right? We, we decided to launch a kind of centralized proof of concept version. And it was too successful. Very quickly, we got to a million users. Now, in 2016, you only had really Bitcoin and Ethereum. And, you know, both of them uh, were incapable of handling a million users. Uh, so uh, I call it kind of the most successful beta test in the world, Sweatcoin. Now it's got 120 million users. And uh, it's only now, basically, with the creation of high-performance L1s like Near that we've been able to actually make the leap. It's a bit like Netflix, right? You probably remember the story that Netflix in the early days actually used to send video cassettes in the post um, because the broadband wasn't powerful enough to support uh, streaming of high quality video content. Uh, so it was about waiting until the, the ecosystem was ready for, the tech, for, for us to kind of move in. Um, and so because there was always a kind of promise that one day Sweatcoin would launch some kind of crypto asset. Our users were very highly primed for it, right? And we did a lot of user research test and user testing. And it was it was the number one most requested thing. The, the two things they wanted, our users were one, more value for their steps, and two, crypto. Now, crypto actually solves both one and two, right? Because it gives them more value because now they've got you know, previously they were receiving a centralized asset like an air mile, the, the sweat coin asset that could only be used within the sweat coin ecosystem. Now they're receiving a crypto asset, which is liquid and has a lot more uh, clear fundamental value that we're able to give it to them. So uh, we know that, you know, crypto was extremely highly demanded by our user base. And this is really exciting for the space because our user base are not crypto natives, right? They're crypto curious. That's what we call them. They're curious about crypto. They want to learn more. They want to experiment and try it out, but they don't want to, um, you know, they don't want to risk too much. They're cautious, and so that I think is the the niche or the segment that that we serve very very well. Got it. Thank you. So, do you think that um, so? from a user perspective, maybe they don't care as much about whether it's something like Web 2, something Web 2.5, something Web 3, in terms of a technical build. Um, you know, like in the very beginning, you guys were, you know, even though with crypto in your head, um, 
But then the technical build is entirely Web2, right? Until the technology, um, the Web3 technology become more available, um, then you now are able to build a de- more, rather a decentralized tech build uh, while ensuring that the user experience is smooth and also, you know, unlocking all the monetization opportunities of the steps. Do you think that people don't really care whether that's something like Web2, Web3, as long as you can deliver the power of crypto, of monetization and being decentralized? So, sorry guys, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, Yeah, so basically, um, I think that a, a minority of users, it really depends, right? Um, depending on mm. what, um, like what kind of user you're talking about. The um, Some users care a lot and some users don't. Now, the kind of hardcore crypto native early adopters, they care about whether it's web you know, Web 2 or Web 2.5 or Web 3, if it's non-custodial or if it's a custodial solution, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a mind, that now, that represents, those early adopters, um, that represents the kind of crypto natives that we know at the moment. Um, But it's, of the overall global population, it's a small minority. It's only, I would say, 5 to 10%. Now, the remaining 90 to 95%, don't care whether or not it's Web 2.5, Web 2, uh, Web 2, Web 3, or whatever. They just want to. They just want it to work. They want the best user experience. They don't really want to look much beyond that. Um, so, essentially, I think what what we're seeing now is there are clear benefits and clear value adds for Web 3, pure native Web 3 solutions, right, which are non-custodial, um, but we've kind of been sitting in in a halfway house, right? In web 2.5 for the last five, six years, because we've wanted access to a sort of decentralized assets, but we've wanted the sort of benefits of centralized infrastructure and cent- centralized user experience. It's only now I think that um, we can actually have the best of both, which is access to decentralized assets, crypto assets, using decentralized or non-custodial um, solutions like the Near Wallet, which is what the Sweat Wallet is built around. It has um, a, a UX that is as good as anything in Web2. And I think that's demonstrated by the fact that we were able at Sweat Economy to create, what was it, 15, 14, 15 million non-custodial wallets in, in three months. And it took you know the user about 30 seconds to create the wallet that is, I think, a game changer for the industry and extremely uh, significant. Great, thank you. So um, I guess, um, Dexter, I would like to ask about, you know, um, just now Henry talked about the near wallet and, you know, the X uh, um, about building something on top of near wallet. What, what, what's, your, what's your view on, you know, the near wallet and then, you know, what you're trying to build uh, out of sender wallet? Um, sorry, what was the question again? <clears throat> yeah, so like Henry just now mentioned, uh, you know, as um, the overall Web3 uh, technologies is getting better, uh, we now are able to uh, deliver better user experience using, uh, you know, uh, crypto technologies. In, um, particularly, he mentioned about the near wallet um, on which um, the spread wallet was built. So what, what, what is your view on, on the wallet side of things um, about the value add that you guys are trying to deliver to um, um, mass adoption of Web2 users? Uh, what are some of the additional value propositions that Sender Wallet is trying to build for um, all these users? So yeah. I'll just trick to the point. So like basically, like as you guys know, Neo Protocol is being more <coughs> user and developer friendly, right? and it requires less complicated hardware to function. So, and the reason that our sender team um, decided to build the wallet on near protocol, it's because uh, crypto wallet is a, is a very important infrastructure of public chain itself. And there's only a wallet on near official, I mean, previously. So based on this, like, um, we did a lot of research and we realized that um, the demand for mobile wallet and extension wallet is quite high. 
So I guess there's a reason that we decided to create the first browser extension wallet to build on here. Yeah. Got it. So um, I wonder, like, um, out of the sender wallet population, um, uh, have you guys looked into, like, how much of these people are actually coming, you know, as a crypto native from maybe Ethereum, from other from other ecosystems and you know how, how many of them are actually coming from a rather web2 space without knowing too much I'm about i'm not crypto? sure about it because i'm more into the community side yeah i see i see so yeah i guess then from the community side um so um um so what what do you see some of the challenges of you know onboarding more communities um uh, I think based yeah. on my personal opinion, I think the major challenges that we face at the moment is the market condition right now. As you guys know, like a lot of FUD recently and many investors or traders lost their trust in Web3 and everyone is being cautious now. And the other point is education part because uh, most of the people still not understand about Web3 or blockchain technology, stuff like that. Yeah, so I think that's the reason. I mean, that's the challenge that we are facing right now for the community side. Great, thank you. So, yeah, then I guess I would like to know a little bit from Drew. Um, so you guys are building something super amazing um, about Web3 Social. Um, so compared to the you know existing user experience uh, offering from the Web2 place, um, how do you see you know Web3 Social projects are uh, awesome? Maybe in the coming year, um, what what are some of the offerings that we are able to provide, and what are some of the limitation or challenges that we cannot deliver as good from the side uh, from the perspective of use of user experience yeah sure so um let me go ahead and kind of explain a little bit about our, our vision of connect 3 and, and how that relates to the broader web 3 market that we see in the future so at connect 3 we believe there's currently two paradigms that are occurring right now um that are going to really onboard users in the web 3 so the first is um, the shift to what we call interest graphs. So if you think about the early Web2 experience, you know, even looking at Google and Gmail and Instagram and a lot of the early social platforms, they're all built around the follower graph. And you use the follow graph to make content recommendations to you in your news page. So the follower graph is, it could be powerful, um, at least in enabling you to connect with people that you already know in the real world. But with apps like TikTok and uh, Xiaohongshu, which is um, called the Little Red Book in China, um, there's a massive movement towards the interest graph. And the interest graph can actually be much more powerful than the follower graph because it can update and, and change in real time. Uh, to your interests and it's not uh, based on um, this hard follower graph you can actually have content recommendations of things that you're really interested in that has no connection to a follower graph whatsoever so the recommendations become way more powerful so if you take this idea of the interest graph which every single person has um, and pair it with the idea that hey what if you could store this interest graph in the blockchain and you could own permission and monetize it and use it as a universal login to any service to have on-demand recommendations we think that that paradigm is much more powerful and that paradigm is really the the movement that we see in crypto um, or, or web3 you know to have a decentralized identity so we think that the second paradigm is the shift from, you know, this centralization to decentralization. And we call it the movement to the open social web. And this movement is basically very similar to what I just mentioned. It's being able to take that interest graph that you've generated and then be able to own permission and monetize it. So by owning, what that means is you own your interest graph and you can control who can access it and who can permission it. And then at the same time, you can monetize it um, by being able to essentially um, control or permission who can access it and how much it costs to access. And we think that this is going to be extremely powerful because right now um, you have no control over your interest graph and you can't use your interest graph for anything. Like if I could use my TikTok identity 
uh, or, or interest graph for dating or for e-commerce or for listening to music? Um, how can we universalize that experience across all the services in Web3 and connect them all together so that now I can connect and plug plug into um, you know other people that have a similar interest graph, um, other places that I could log into or, or go to to have fun, um, and, and other content that I'm interested in, as well as all of the other people uh, that I want to connect with and services that can provide me amazing uh, recommendations um, and services that I actually want to use instead of just advertising. So that's kind of uh, the, the paradigm shift that we're looking at. And um, we believe that this is going to be like a much more powerful, interesting world that's much more consumer centric instead of, you know, just um, getting ads every single day from Facebook and Instagram uh, and have an opening up Gmail, which is basically just all spam. So, uh, yeah, we want to really create a, a much more powerful user experience, and we're really excited to do that in the Web3 world. In terms of the challenges, I think the biggest challenge right now is absolutely with the tool. Uh, what is the real tool needed in Web3 to convince people that, hey, I actually want to use Web3 uh, in a universal way? I think that right now we're clearly lacking a very strong uh, there's, there is a use case, but from a mainstream adoption perspective, there is no use case because there's no tool that has been created that everyone wants to use or everyone has to use. And so far, this tool hasn't been uh, created in such a way that it is preferable to um, doing it in Web2. So without taking too much more time, I, I really think it's just uh, all about the tool. Uh, and building a tool that everyone wants to use or has to use. Uh, that's where we're really lacking right now, and that's where the biggest challenge is. So it's very difficult to onboard all of these users into Web3. Great, very interesting. We'd definitely love to grow deeper into, uh, look deeper into, um, you know, some of the technical infrastructure that you guys have been thinking. Uh, but I guess before that, uh, I would like to know a little bit about what are some of the tools that um, near... Uh, provide to you guys and then you know what did those tools empower and then what are some of the tools that you really wish you could have uh while you know probably nearest developing um um shall we start with henry on this sure please could you repeat the question oh sorry i, I am, am i am i cracking is the line cracking no i think sorry um uh, my, my line went silent oh, okay. for a little bit oh. sorry no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I, so just now, um, just now, Drew mentioned that um, some of the uh, current current challenges that we have encountered uh, would be the tools that are available for projects to build. So, um, uh, in considering um, you guys are you know onboarding, uh, you you guys are building on near. What are some of the tools that you found useful um, when you guys are developing your project? Uh, your project. And what are some of the tools that you would like to have um, in the future um, to further, you know, strengthen your product? Absolutely. So I think, you know, when we were, I, I previously mentioned, you know, we had gone through four months of testing, right? We tested, I think, over 13 different L1s and L2s. And... Um, it was really extremely rigorous testing. It was a very kind of resource intensive testing process, right? If you think about it, actually, um, you know, Sweatcoin is a pretty big company. It, it you know, already with, when it had with its 130 million users. Um, so for us to sort of allocate, and we had to allocate four months to testing all of these L1s and L2s. And I think so, I think um, basically a tool that would allow more rapid uh, testing, spinning up test nets and everything else would have been valuable because it would have helped us arrive to that decision much quicker. Um, that will come with time, right? We understand that we're pioneering in this way. We're the first, I think we're, I think Sweatcoin is probably the first mass market, you know, large Web2 product um, to, to come into Web3 in the way that it's done so. So I think that, you know, others will have an easier time once there is a, a better kind of formula, once more projects have kind of experimented and tested with it. But I think certainly more tools around um, testing would have been valuable. And then I think that one of the tools really that, that 
um, helped to convince us that near was the best place was this was the near wallet i think it's uh um i, I know that we have uh people on the call who are also making additional wallets i i'm not familiar with those so i can't uh comment on on them but certainly the near wallet was um an extremely powerful tool right we wanted a way to for users to be able to create a non-custodial wallet in the easiest possible way now the the kind of current um uh, kind of solutions that you see with like MetaMask or Ledger with, you know, having uh, private keys and, uh, you know, 64 character, you know, uh, secret phrases and all that stuff and backup that again, that works for the the five to 10% of the, the first movers, the early movers, but it doesn't work for the, the 90 to 95% of the, of the mass market, you know, the population that represents the mass market, the mainstream adoption. So the fact that our users, could set up a non-custodial wallet using their email um, and do it in 30 seconds uh, was an extremely powerful tool. And it also demonstrated Nier's kind of commitment to um, to being the mass market blockchain. I think, you know, it's very hard. It's, it's kind of impossible for me to uh, believe a blockchain wants to be mass market if it hasn't even created the tools to enable mass market adoption. But I think that's one of the things that really distinguishes Nier is that it has done that. Great, thank you. So, um, yeah, Drew, would, would, would you like to add a little bit more about, you know, the, 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 the tools from Nier that you found, you know, um, attractive to use uh, from, a, from, from the perspective of a project and some of the tools that you would like uh, Nier to further develop in the future? Yeah, I think Nier provides easy to go development kits for builders, and this really enables them to fast onboard onto its blockchain ecosystem. Um, on the user side, I think the interaction experience is also much better, and the cost is lower. So um, currently, we're you know uh, available on on Nier as well as uh, additional blockchains, uh, and we want to support all the blockchains. But what we found on Nier particularly useful for us is just the um, the development kits that are already available. And we think that being able to plug in and play um, very fast is going to be the key to unlock um, the value for additional developers and, and also developers who are just now onboarding into Web3. Um, obviously, it's going to be about how easy and simplified the development process is and the different tools that are, that are available um, f for, for users already. So I think for us, it's really just been the um, the onboarding, as well as uh, being able to easily connect with people at Near who can help us uh, answer questions. So also the development community, um, making it very easy to connect builders with builders, as well as builders with the Near ecosystem, uh, so you can get you know uh, very fast feedback on um, on any issues or, or roadblocks that you run into on the development side. Um, so yeah, I think those are, are kind of like the main things that we've been thinking about. Uh, in terms of uh, a, like a wish list of found, of, um, of uh, uh, features that we wish were available right now, I, I don't really have any off the top of the, uh, top of my mind, but it's been really just about the development process so far and uh, the um, kind of kind of the, the, the kits that are available that you can just plug in and, and play with uh, very fast. Um, so I think it's the, the initial onboarding experience as well as the, um, the general features that are available right now that, that really make a difference. Great, thank you. So Dexter, um, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, probably from a wallet perspective, you know, what are some of the additional tools that you guys are building or, you know, what are some of the um, things that you wish um, you know near to further develop for tools um, um, to to ease the process of mass adoption. Um, actually, Sender team is currently uh, focused on building the multi chains and MPC wallet to lowering the barriers of entry for new user. And yeah, we also focus on improving the security part as well. I guess that's that's it. Got it. Would you like to let us know a little bit about the MPC um, um, feature that you guys have been building? You mean the, the more details for the MPC part? Yeah. Uh, I don't think I can share more about it here because the backend team haven't let me know about it. 
Got it. Thank you. Um, so I guess moving up next would be, you know, like the social part has, you know, like when, 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 when we talk about mass adoption, right? Social has always been one of the key verticals that people are looking into. So, uh, when it comes to social, um, you know, as what Drew mentioned about the uh, decentralized identities, you know, those are something really powerful, right? Especially when we see a lot of the flaws that we already see from the web two space. Um, I guess, Drew, would you like to let us know a little bit more about, um, you know, some of the things that you guys keep on building um, in terms of making decentralized identities to be better? Yeah, totally. So that's also something that, that we're thinking about constantly as we build out the product, uh, especially, you know, how can we connect uh, people to people, people to content and people to services uh, in a very seamless way? Um, that definitely involves the identity. And we think that one thing, you know, that's lacking right now when people talk about the metaverse is obviously an identity. It's like, how can you connect in the metaverse if you have no standardized identity? Uh, so we really think that the identity is going to be the, the most important thing uh, when it comes to kind of this mass adoption, if that is going to be the tool. And what I mentioned earlier about the the tool aspect is 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 not really tooling from the from, from the near side, but the tool from the consumer side. So for users, what is the tool that they want to use or they they need to use in their daily lives? Um, I think that's really what people are trying to figure out right now uh, for 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 Web three. And we believe that this tool is going to come around um, the the idea of the interest graph. Because you have so much data about yourself right now on all these Web2 platforms. But unfortunately, none of that data is unified um, and uh, universal in the sense that I can use you know, one identity to log into everything. And we really think that that's going to be the key, is unlocking um, every person's interest graph and then enabling them to own permission and monetize that interest graph um, so that they can do with it whatever they want. And they can use it to, um, you know, make their life way more uh, efficient. So that's basically what we're really working on and um, trying to figure out the, the main tool to onboard users to get them to realize the value of their interest graph. Um, but also, what is the tool um, that we can use to onboard users uh, in, in an easy, fast way um, that enables them to then create their interest graph because it's difficult to create an interest graph from scratch. So that's another um, kind of aspect that we're thinking about right now is what is that um, killer tool that will convince people, um, hey, like I need to, uh, I, I need this tool. I want to use this tool. Um, it's relevant to my daily life. I have to have it. Uh, that's kind of the tool that that we're we're focusing on building right now, uh, and still trying to figure out. But the long term goal is to um, you know um, make it much easier to to connect um, people to people, people to services, and people to content. Got it. So, like one of the one of the questions that people have been asking about decentralized identity would be, you know, some of the uh, personal identification information is meant to be private, right? right. So, um, so um, you know, like some of the, you know, like you might want to carry, you know, your interest graph or some of your own identity information around, but where are those data saved? Um, you know, is there like uh, currently in crypto, do you see really good solution for, you know, having some of the personal identity to be saved in an encrypted way? Or like what are some of the views about like managing the, use the privacy side of things um, uh, for mass adoption? Yeah, that, that's definitely a, a great question. And I think that the um, different types of personal information is definitely on a pyramid. So there's different types of information that you probably only want to know and you don't want anyone to know versus other types of information that it, it, as long as it's encrypted um, and it's stored in such a way that um, you, you can permission who can and can't access it, um, perhaps through a smart contract, you know, that makes um, a validity time, but perhaps certain information is available um, for a specific amount of time to these specific types of users. I think that a very easy UI um, and, and way of interaction uh, where you can go in and control 
um, who can and cannot access specific types of information and the validity, um, the, the time period that that information can be um, accessed. I think that's really going to be um, definitely like a, a key part in the future. And it comes down to the designing um, not only technically how that's uh, built out and implemented, but also um, the user experience for going through and being able to control that. Um, there's so many different dimensions of your um, of, of both your personality and your identity. Um, how to um, standardize that into something that uh, everyone agrees on. And whether or not I can use that as a login, say, to a country like would I be able to leave the U.S. and just walk into, um, you know, any country and and just use uh, facial recognition uh, to log in, or is it possible to use facial recognition um, in, in such a way that I can just walk around anywhere without using my phone? And perhaps you could use uh, zero knowledge proofs to prove, you know, that hey, like just based off my face, because I have, let's say, like um, I have a, a, I have my face uploaded as well. Um, but it's encrypted in such a way, or or maybe we can use uh, zero knowledge proofs or some some similar tech where I can use my face to log into any place uh, without that place actually knowing that it's me. They can prove that it's me, but but that information that it is me is is not, is not passed uh, to the actual place itself. So it can still preserve my identity while at the same time proving that it's me. And I think those sorts of um, features and tools, it makes it much more convenient to live in the world because no longer do I need to bring um, these physical identities with me in my pocket. Um, I can just take my phone. And I think China, um, for those of you who, who on the call who have not been to China, I think China is, um, when you use WeChat, it's a massive enabler to your life because you can use WeChat to log into everything. Uh, WeChat obviously is not it's not decentralized. It's the opposite, to- totally the opposite. But um, the convenience that it brings to your life as a universal login and that you can use your WeChat to do everything seamlessly is is so underrated um that we really think that that is 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 the key to unlocking um the mass adoption is the convenience how can you make something super convenient but at the same time safe um and and at the same time you have complete power and control over um that's that's really going to be like the killer feature i think uh within web3 Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess like I, I personally have been, you know, lived, uh, living in China for several years. WeChat is definitely like a super app that you can do like everything. You can pay your phone bill, you can pay your utility bill, you can buy a movie ticket, you know, like not, you know, on top of all of the social functions that you have. Uh, then we also know that, you know, by by using WeChat and interacting with it, it means all of your data is being stored or by managed or, or managed by Tencent or potentially like even the Chinese government, right? So like this is definitely, you know, like people are thinking, oh, on one hand, we got all of the convenience that we would like to have, but then we also lose all of our privacy, right? So definitely, I think what you guys are building is something super powerful um, for, you know, getting back to the point of user experience, you know, so much um, there, there's so much to, to be done in the user experience side. Uh, but while we are ensuring that, you know, by decentralization um, and also like the encryption that you just mentioned, you know, we have a, a healthy balance of good user experience and, you know, great privacy management that is even greater than, you know, the Web2 spaces um, um, in terms of uh, managing your identities. So I guess, Henry, uh, definitely would like to know, given that you guys have so many users on board it um, already, uh, do you see you guys to, you know, evolve to like an identity project as well? Um, are you guys like heading toward that direction? What are some of the roadmaps that you want to, uh, that, that you would like to highlight? That's a, it's a really interesting uh, question. At the moment, we do not see the sweat wallet becoming um, an identity layer in and of itself in the sense that we don't see ourselves creating um you know whichever part of the the stack tech stack that is actually verifying people's identity but what we can do of course is provide one of the um we can integrate with existing solutions that other specialists create 
uh, to verify and cr- uh, attach an identity to tens of millions of on-chain wallets, uh, which is extremely powerful, right? Because on-chain identity has network effects. So by adding whatever, by adding tens of millions of users, it just makes the entire process much, much more powerful. But another interesting thing that we can do, um, we believe with with uh, Sweat, is of course if you're if you're creating an asset that is issued by physical activity, then um, you need to verify that that physical activity is real. Of course, you know as soon as you give people an incentive to move, they try everything they can to try and spoof the movement. Right? They shake their phone and and uh, you know attach it to the dog and the treadmill and whatever uh, washing machine. <laughs> Um, and so we've had to create a very, very sophisticated proof of movement um, system, right? Like a kind of middleware system so that we can identify what is real organic human movement and what is fake movement. Now, if you extend that, right? So if you can verify what is real organic human movement, you can actually then verify other things about somebody, something such as, are they alive? Now, that sounds a bit sort of... Uh, hypothetical at the moment but why would it be useful to know whether or not somebody is alive well if you include a concept like universal basic income right now if you start paying people a universal basic income just to be alive then similar to sweat right where people fake movement people will actually fake being alive right they'll pretend that you know somebody who actually died is still alive so they can keep on getting paid um, their universal basic income. So what we do think that Sweat can do is actually produ- is provide um, a proof of aliveness. Now, if you combine that with a proof of, and that's very complementary to a proof of identity, of course, right? If you combine proof of identity with proof of aliveness, um, you know, they, it's very, very useful and the, the two things work together very well. Great, thank you. So I guess it comes to my last question um, uh, about market sentiments in general. You know, with the recent crash of the markets, and we are, you know, now in a bear market. What, what, what the market sentiments have an impact on? You know, um, your current development plan. Uh, what are the things that you guys are still like actively working on? Uh, or do like the market crashes have an impact on you know your 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 overall plan you know maybe half a year ago? Um, so um, should we start with Henry? Yeah, absolutely. So honestly, we uh, the market impact doesn't really have a massive um, impact on us in a kind of direct way. Um, you know we. You know, we're very fortunate at Sweatcoin, right? Sweatcoin is a profitable business. Sweat economy even is a profitable business. And so that means that we, you know, we can kind of um, keep going, right? And build products that people like to use. We, we've always been focused on, you know, obviously we are a B2C mass market product. And the the success, the, the most important thing for being a successful mass market product is having product market fit and that means that people just need to love using your product not use your product because they want to make money on it right that's not product market fit because if people are only using your product to make money then uh as soon as they stop making money they're going to stop uh using the product and we've seen that with many um, and that works kind of in a bull market, right? Pr- token prices are going up and pumping, pumping, pumping. So everybody's making money. They use the products. But as soon as the token price goes down, they stop using the product. Now, the products with product market fit, right, will continue to grow or at least continue to do well in a bear market. And we're seeing that very clearly with sweat. So it's not really changed too much. Obviously, we're just being cautious, or, like everybody is at the moment. I, because... I, I, I don't seem to hear Henry anymore. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Henry. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hey, guys, sorry about that. So, saying, so the bear market hasn't actually changed us a huge amount. 
we're just building you know products that i think our users are going to love it just emphasizes some of the core principles that we want to build things that the people like using right rather than um people use just to make money from it so that's that's really where we are at the moment Great, thank you. How about how about Drew? What, what what do you see the the market has an has an impact on your development plan? Yeah, I actually have a very similar response to Henry. I, um, I think it's definitely all about product market fit, and for us, the product market fit is identifying the tool that users actually really need in, in their daily lives. So for us, um, I don't think the you know what's happened recently has has really had a had a major impact. Uh, in terms of, of the growth of our user base as well as the activity. Um, the, the people that we acquired earlier on, they're more of these kind of core users already. Um, we, we just haven't seen that that mainstream adoption. So I think, you know, the, the recent activity has really hurt um, kind of the, the mainstream perception of, of Web3 for those who, who were never really in it in, in the beginning. Um, but for the core users and earlier adopters, uh, I, I think, a lot of them are still uh, very much alive, and that's that's what we see at, at Connect Three at least. So, in terms of our product roadmap, um, it hasn't really been influenced by the by the recent market. Um, it's it's more been on uh, kind of like the investment side. But for our for our, for for building um, out our product, uh, it, it's it's really it hasn't really changed, and we're still just focused on um, identifying the the killer tool um, that's going to bring on mainstream adoption. Um, and, and what sort of tool um, can inspire that product market fit um, to, to use something that you actually want to use and you have to use? Um, that, that's, that's really the, the key tool that we're trying to identify. Great. Yeah, I guess that's all, all of my question. But I would like to add, add that uh, it, it's really exciting, you know, um, to, to, to speak with you guys, knowing that you guys, you know, indeed has a really great combination of, uh, value add to the space, you know, um, you know, sweat, uh, on one hand, uh, you guys have like a mass adoption. Uh, a lot of web two users are on board into web three because of you guys. And then you guys are also actively thinking about ways, you know, to, to build some of the better user, um, killer features that, you know, Drew mentioned while, you know, uh, connect three has been building some fundamental social, uh, infrastructure, uh, to keep on, you know, enabling users to do more stuff on, on top of Web3, while um, Sender Wallet, um, you guys are, you know, uh, thinking from, you know, how are users are managing their assets while you guys are also doing like the multi-chain, um, um, connecting near uh, with some of the other e ecosystems as well. Um, so, um, so yeah, I guess now, um, yeah, that that's all of my questions I would like to ask. I now I will see. I would like to see if like there's any questions from the audience who would like to ask our guests. Eunice, can you can you um, give the mic to um, Crypto King? I think he 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 has been raising his hand. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. Um. So actually, I have a question for um Sander Wallet. So, um, I believe most wallet these days usually um like this feature of uh, having the multi-signature in. So I just want to ask if there are any plans of um, integrating this into the Sender Wallet. Yeah, good question. Uh, Sender Wallet is currently uh, integrated with the Aurora. And we also have done our integrate with the uh, hardware ledger. Okay, okay, I'm thinking. Great, uh, noted that like Henry might need to run um, anytime soon. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, let, let, let's let um, have, have the floor open um, for more questions for now. Also, no. um, yeah, Mario, we can hear you. 
All right, good day, everyone, and um, thanks for bringing me on to ask my question. Uh, I can say this such an uh, informative and uh, education, uh, educative AME per se. So my question for Sender Wallet is, uh, you know, regarding the uh, current bear market situation now that we are in, I, I just want to know as a project, what strategy would you say it has worked for you so far in gaining mass adoptions to your uh, platforms? And do you think this need are uh, improving or adopting a new strategy based on marketing? All right, good question. So Thank basically you. the market crash is definitely impacted us a lot because we are a crypto wallet and we, we, we are like a tool that provides service to user. And then due to the market crash, a lot of users run away or they don't... Uh, they don't trade anymore or done any tra transaction, but it doesn't matter. We are still working on like, like what we should do and based on our roadmap, we are still working on everything. Yeah, as I well, mentioned well, before, really uh, we are, right now we are working on the multi-chain. And also integrating with the Aurora. That's it. Well, well, that's really great. I can say, and I wish you guys all the best. And thanks for the wonderful thanks. job. Thank you. Okay, I just see Rick is uh, raising his hand. Um, Eunice, can you add Rick? Hello? Am I audible? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, thanks for bringing me up. Uh, actually, my question is, uh, uh, looking at the, uh, at the near uh, the, the, the near price, it has been uh, going down uh, so much. So I wanted to know, um, uh, what do you think, uh, as we the holders, what do, you, what do you think we should do? Should we keep on holding this near tokens or, or should we sell them? Um, I think that's a subjective question, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just let me maybe let me add on to this a little bit. So, um, well, so like speaking from the perspective of uh, Meta Web, right? So, I guess, um, so I think Near is interesting in the way that you know, as what the guest has been mentioning, you know some of the fundamental tools that we have are really great for mass adoption. And then uh, from Nier's perspective, the growth or uh, the flywheel of growth of Nier is always going on for a long term uh, in the way that number one, we are trying to build um, greater, greater economy um, in the way that we are onboarding more um, great NFTs uh, that have uh, use cases on, on Nier. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, we are creating better social uh, contexts so that creator fans, you know, like crypto users, they are all interacting on the blockchain. Um, this is why, you know, like that, that that's also why what, what Connect3 has been building. And then finally, um, that would be DeFi, you know, because as people are onboarding, having more native assets on near on, on the blockchain and interacting with each other, they would like to manage the assets as well, right? Um, and then as people are managing, um, the assets through DeFi, you know, they, they might want to also create more assets. Uh, this turns to be a flywheel of growth. Um, this is sort of near growth strategy. So if you look into like the last cycle, um, to be honest, we don't have a lot of, we didn't have a lot of, you know, um, uh, assets with great use cases. I, I, I think that's not the case of near. That's a case of like, many of the ecosystems, uh, arguably even e e Ethereum, right? So, uh, but then we have been seeing a lot of um, technological advancements uh, in this field, you know, you know what, what, what we can do with NFT. Like for example, MetaWeb uh, invested in a project where you can use the NFTs to crowdfund Hollywood films. You know, we have seen projects uh, building better experience NFTs in a way that NFT is not only a collectible, but then it actually converts to real life 
experiences with friends. You know, there are a lot of these um, were uh, real world use cases that uh, different projects have been building. And then from that perspective, you know, when we are developing, you know, mass adoption goes on, you know, I think near fundamental tech about all these great tools and, um, and APIs and stuff like that to empower brands and empower projects on uh, the edge of it um, uh, would be more, um, would be easier to be understood or uh, would be adopted um, in a wider, um, uh, through a wider audience. But that, that, that's definitely not our investment uh, advice, right? But then that's uh, how I see Nier. Um, and then definitely also Nier has been like building a lot of the great games. That, and I, I mean, like games itself has a lot of like really high quality digital assets and we didn't have because we never had like really great games in crypto. But then we also see, but now we see a lot of the really capable gaming um, teams. They are also building something like really legit on blockchain and particularly on Nier. So, um, so I think, so like only from, uh, like I guess from my own perspective, it's a really, it, it's a market downturn. You know, everybody, everybody's upset about the token prices. You know, everything is down by a lot. But um, if you think about the fundamentals of crypto, if you don't think about the market conditions, if you only think about the fundamentals of cryptos, what it is enabled, what it empowers people to do, do uh, based on what we, that many of our uh, guest speakers have mentioned today as well, right? Um, I think the fundamentals has only become uh, greater and greater. So uh, that's my view, but like definitely not investment advice, right? So um, see, um, do you have, whether you have more questions on this that you would like to discuss? Okay, I see more people are raising their hands. Um, Sam Cheese, uh, Ziwa, IB, uh, Eunice, would you mind um, adding them? All right, can I proceed with my question? Yeah, Sam, I guess, um, yeah, we, we can wrap up this um, maybe after your question, but for more questions, definitely we can leave it on the on 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 the Twitter Twitter on the tweet and then we can we can get back to it uh, maybe personally as well but um, yeah Sam can you do, do you wanna do you wanna um, repeat your question yeah I I wanna ask my question so um, my question is the Swiss economy I don't know if he's still here oh I think he has left. I think he needed to drop by by you know okay. three minutes ago. Okay, guys, I still have question for for Zendal wallet. I'm actually using Zendal wallet, but I want to know if um in future if you're gonna have wallet extension, and also I want I want to know if I, I can I will be able to stick using the Zendal wallet because currently the one I'm using there is no staking ability. At least this could help to sustain the price of near. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we do have the extension wallet on uh, Chrome, Chrome browser, Brave, Kiwi, and Edge. And of course, we do have the stacking feature on other extension wallet and the mobile wallet as well. You should try the stacking feature. Okay, I have the stacking on mobile wallet because maybe it's because my mine is out of the Let me update it because I really want to stake mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Right. But is it available on iOS? I mean the staking because I'm using iOS, the Zender iOS. Is it available? What what is it? Pardon? I mean the staking is the staking available because I have the Zender on my iOS, but I've not updated it lately, so I don't know if the staking is available on iOS. Yeah, yeah. The, the staking vessel. is available on iOS. Okay. Yeah. Except okay, the swap but feature. I also have... The swap feature is not have... available on the mobile app yet. Oh, oh, alright. Yeah. So, are you having plans to launch your own tokens, you know? Maybe you could have your own Zenda token or anything in the future. Did you get my question? Sorry, I can't hear you. I asked if you have plans of launching your own token in the future. Yeah, we do have a plan for that, but we haven't uh, announced anything about the token for Sender yet. So you may stay tuned for that. All right. Thank you very much. I will update my Zender so I can stick my near. Thank sure. you very much. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So um, I, I, I see some of the audience are still raising their hands, but then the, the, the speakers uh, need to get off uh, now. So uh, uh, would you uh, would you leave your questions in um, in the in, in a tweet and then uh, we will send a question to the um, to the speaker and then get back to you. But um, thank you so much uh, uh, for the time of um, of discussing um, mass adoption with us tonight. Um, um, so uh, let, let's wrap up here. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, please do leave your...